we're going to start my bourbon project. So here I've got my ingredients. As a, with any whiskey, you can't add sugar or any anything like that to bump up your alcohol. Technically, you're only allowed to use grain. And I'm doing this for a hobby, and I want to do it right. And so I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned. I've been doing this for a few years. Started out with some pretty nasty product. Don't know what happened to it. I don't recall drinking it. But over the years, I've I've learned a lot about ingredients procedures and equipment done some tweaks so now I'm going to share what I've learned with you so bourbon has to be at least 51 percent corn so in my uh, recipe I'm going to use seven and a half liters of grain in total four and a half liters of corn one and a half liter of rye and one and a half liters of malted barley so this corn I get from a local feed store <clears throat> it's cracked corn so um, it's halfway there I still have to grind it in my hand grinder so I'll grind four and a half liters of that this costs about 11 bucks for 55 pounds it's pretty pretty reasonable price and uh, this rye the rye kernels I got from from uh, a local flour mill that uh, that supplies all these different types of grains so that was handy and then the uh, malted barley I got from a local beer and wine supplier this is two row malted barley. You need to use a malted barley when you're making whiskey because it contains the enzyme, the amylase enzyme, which converts the, the starch in the grains into sugar. And then you'll be able to ferment that and then distill it afterwards. So um, my next step is to grind this, these grains up into a finer, almost like a flour and then uh, next step after that is is to uh, to mash it so uh, let's get on with that so I put the uh, corn the cracked corn into my Victoria hand grinder this is a fairly slow and tedious uh, procedure I guess it takes me maybe 25 20-25 minutes to do all the grinding and uh, I actually don't mind it, it's a little bit of quiet time. I get some work out here. Now, I'm not going to force you to look at me doing this for 25 minutes, but I'll just grind a bit and then you can see what the uh, product looks like. So, here basically is what the corn looks like after I run it through my grinder. It's like a flour, kind of a coarse flour. Now you can buy this already ground into flour. You can buy corn, a flake corn, which is, uh, you can skip this whole process if you want. I've just decided to go with a grinder, do everything kind of naturally. So I got the corn done. That's my, just finishing off now, the four and a half liters of corn. So now I'm going to put the rye in there and I'm going to grind the rye grain up. So I've got the one and a half liters of uh, the rye grain in the hopper. So We'll just grind that up now and then I'll throw that in along with my ground up corn. It's a bit of work but uh, I consider it a pretty good exercise. The rye flour here is not quite as fine as the corn. The rye is a lot harder. But it's flour, just a little bit coarser than the corn. So I'm just about wrapping up here on grinding up this uh, the rye the rye uh, kernels. So now I'm grinding up the barley grain. This is quite a bit softer than the rye, and even the corn smells real good too. It's been malted. So it's been processed to the point where uh, now when, when I throw that in hot water, the enzymes there will start converting the sugars, the, sh the starch I should say from the corn and the rye, and also from the barley, it'll start converting those starches into sugar. So once I've done grinding this, I'm going to keep this separate because the barley, I keep that separate from the corn and the rye. Because the corn and the rye, as we'll see, I'm gonna, I have to kind of, cook that ahead of time they call that uh, gelatinizing 
Then when I bring the temperature down from 190 degrees Fahrenheit down to about 160, 165 degrees Fahrenheit, then I'll chuck the this barley in, and then uh, the barley will get to work and convert the starch into sugar, and that's uh, that's what the mashing process is all about. So I guess the next step is to uh, once I get this all ground up, is to get some get some hot water going and mash these grains. Okay, so now I've uh, got my about 17, 18 liters of water boiling here, ready to mash. Well, I just use a kitchen thermometer here to verify the temperature, nothing too fancy. I like to keep things pretty simple. The nice thing about these thermometers is the battery never dies on them because they don't have a battery. So just checking my, my temperature here and it's running about 190 maybe a little more so I'm gonna introduce the grain to this hot water so as I pour this in you'll, you'll, you'll experience that it tends to clump and just become like a big, big clump of floating flour in here and then it gets all stuck together and it's pretty tough to stir this stuff up so uh, I just use a power tool for that so I use a paint stirrer and a cordless drill and uh, of course the paint stirrer has been cleaned up real nice don't worry about that the nice thing with cordless drill is uh, it doesn't you can regulate the speed a lot better than you can on a power drill power drills are well they got too much power the ones that you plug in I used that once and it flew the stuff all over the kitchen I had trouble I'm just breaking this up and uh, once we get it kind of uh, blend it in here into the water and it'll uh, start mixing a lot nicer and getting it going there change direction get that thing all mixed up got to use really slow speed on this otherwise like I said you'll be cleaning the kitchen kitchen up for a few hours it's gooey mess speed again or reverse the direction I can see so now I'm going to put the rest of the grain in We got some big clumps floating around in here, so uh, yeah, you just got to break them up, and uh, so that we can get all that grain exposed to the hot water. So, like I said, this is called gelatinizing. So I'm just gonna let this stuff. Uh, it's a pretty hot, pretty high temperature, 190 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, this softens this up so that uh, the starch is more readily available for the amylase, the enzyme to work on. So I've got a few more clumps in here. So after I get this all mixed in real nice, then I'm just going to let it cover it over and let it sit until the temperature goes down to about 165 Fahrenheit. And then I'll be putting the, the uh, barley in there. So pretty good there now I'm just gonna give it a bit stir
reverse the speed or the direction. Make sure we get that. Make the turn real good. Okay, that's good. I'll try not to get this all over the stuff all over the place. So, just take a look at it. It's a bit watery looking, but after like the 20 minutes or half an hour, I'm going to sit there, maybe 40 minutes, it'll completely uh, tighten up and be like a thick porridge. It'll be awful looking. And then I'll put the barley in at that point. So this uh, mash has been sitting here for about 40 minutes. I'm just going to check the temperature of it. And uh, as I predicted or I've experienced in the past, this has just gelled right up. It's all them starches being released from the grain. And I've got 160, actually it's still climbing, 165, it's probably 170 degrees. So it's a little bit warm to be putting the, uh, the barley in at this point in time. And this has been about 40 minutes later. Now I can cool this down if I want. I could add a bit of a bit of uh, cold water to it, or just leave the lid off and stir it up a bit more, just to release some of that heat. So uh, yeah, you can really see the difference. I'll just show you. Yeah, before it was a bit soupy, and look at it now. It's like uh, boom. So this is where it really comes in handy using a power mixer to get that barley in there. It's really hard to get that mixed in and homogenized if you're not using a, that power mixer. So I'll just cool this down and then we'll get right back to it. Okay, so I added a liter or so of cold water to the mash and stirred it up with my power mixer and uh, temperature right now is right about just below 160 so that's optimal you don't want it to be higher than 165 Fahrenheit it uh, the amylase enzyme works from about 160 down to 140 there's a whole science behind that not really uh, I read up on it but I don't remember all those details so now I'm just going to mix that in And uh, start out with this just to get it kind of integrated. And you'll notice when you start mixing it in almost immediately the, the uh, mash in here starts to get a little more watery just because the enzyme is converting the starch into sugar. That's pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to get the. Uh, this isn't working out that good. I'm going to get the mixer going here. I'm going to have a clean up to do in this kitchen. Stick that in there and just start. Start blending that in.
Now you'll notice when you're doing this that uh, already it's starting to be more liquid than it was before. It's a pretty amazing transformation that happens so fast. So now the next step is to let this sit and, uh, and mash. So it's the conversion now from starch to sugar. Now, when I use just straight malted barley, that only takes about 45 minutes. We'll do an iodine test just to uh, see how that's progressing. But I find with the corn, I have to let it mash for like three hours. And even then, uh, it doesn't really pass the iodine test that well, but, but it does produce uh, the sugar that's, that's required. So that's just my experience with this with corn. I'm going to let that sit here now for about three hours. Mix that up a bit more. It's amazing how quickly that starts turning all watery. Remember how porridgey that was before? Now it's gone watery. That's amazing. That's that starch being converted into sugar. If you were to just take a little taste of it, you, you could taste how sweet that's getting. So now, as you see, I just cover the pot up with uh, a couple of towels. There's no heat on it. It's running probably about 155, 160 degrees right now. So I'm going to let that sit for three hours. Then I'll uh, conduct an iodine test on it. And after that, we're gonna we're gonna sparge it or rinse the sugar out of the grains, and that can be pretty tough. But uh, I'll show you how I do that. So now I'm getting ready to sparge the grain that I've been mashing upstairs: the corn, rye, and barley. And I'll just show you what I use for that. I have my primary fermenter here. It's about 30 liters, so it's plenty large. I always clean my equipment out real well. I use a sterilizing cleaner that I get from a wine and beer supply store, like a home when you do home brew, and clean everything up. I don't want any contamination to be to be in this in, in my containers. Of course, I want it nice and clean. So, so I do that. And uh, I used to use at first when I was trying to sparge, I would use a cheesecloth or these bags you can buy strainer bags. I found they're really awkward. They don't really work. A lot of hard work and it can't really get the product out of it. So then I switched over to using this here. It's a five gallon pail. It's food grade. So if you're going to get one, check on the bottom. It'll have a little triangle. And then underneath it should say HDPE, high density polyethylene. And then the number two inside that little recycling uh, symbol here. So as you can see, I just punched a whole set of holes in there with the drill and then after you do that, then you got to clean up all of your holes with a, with a countersink bit. Countersink bit, I'll just show you how I was doing that. Just on the drill bit, go around and, and just uh, touch each one on the inside and on the outside. Cleans it up, get a nice, uh, easy surface. It drains easier and uh, it's a lot easier to clean up afterwards too, rather than having all these plastic, I guess you could call them tags sticking uh sticking uh inside the bucket so anyway that's my that's what i use so i suspend this over top of, of the uh, primary fermenter and then pour my product in here and then start pouring the boiling water and i'll show you how you do that as soon as that uh, mash is ready so now i'm about to start to sparge as I uh, mentioned before, I, I take my, I have my 35 liter primary fermenter there and then my straining bucket just suspended over, over top. It's just simple stuff I find around the house. So now I'm going to pour the hot mash into that and uh, it's hot so you got to be careful you don't burn yourself. Didn't bring a pot holder down but I'll use this instead. So there we go. So 
So uh, now I'm going to let that strain through a little bit. In the meantime, I've uh, put to boil some water on. <coughs> excuse, excuse, excuse me. So I'm going to be rinsing this with about 11 or 12 liters of boiling hot water just to rinse all the sugar out of the grain. <coughs> wow. So I'm going to just throw a bit of water in here and rinse this out, make sure I get all the stuff out of it. This worked out pretty good. There wasn't anything stuck on the bottom of it. That's good. So uh, I have my stir stick here, which I've already sterilized. And in here, if I just stir around where the holes are in that bucket, the stuff pours through pretty good. Right now, it will just kind of plug up the holes because it's pretty thick. And what I'm going to do as soon as that water is boiling, I'm going to pour that boiling water in there to, uh, to rinse it out. Now, some recipes call for fermenting on the grain or, you know, let the light get back on there a bit. Fermenting on the grain or even uh, putting it in the still, still on the grain. But this uh, recipe I use it, I sparge it. Eventually you got to deal with the, the grain. I'd rather deal with it now before I start fermenting and so it just makes it easier. You got to clean it up. You got to get rid of that grain and clean it up eventually. I don't really want to put all that in my still. It's going to be a real mess. If I get a boil over in the still, it's going to be real, real tough to clean that out. So I just, that's why I do this. I'm sparging it now just to get rid of the uh, grain. I can just deal with a liquid afterwards. It's a lot easier. Like I said, you have to deal with it sooner or later, and I've opted just to deal with it now. So this is how I do it. It's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to jump up, run upstairs now and see if the water's boiling, and uh, start to put the boiling water in there to rinse that out. So now I have some boiling water. I'm going to pour it in there. Now the level of fluid in this uh, product mash, you could say, in this straining bucket hasn't really changed at all because... That's still pretty thick in there. So as I pour the boiling water in, that'll start to make it a little more watery and it'll uh, start draining a little better. But this will take uh, quite a few hours. Sometimes I do this last thing before I go to bed and then in the morning I, it's ready. This is a little sort of like mid-afternoon, so maybe later on tonight I'll be able to cool it down and put some yeast in it. So I've just poured the last of my 12 liters of boiling hot water into the mash bed, drain bed you could say, at this point in time. I thought I'd just show you how this works. You see as I pass the stir stick by, it squirts out, it just helps it along. But I do this uh, as I'm adding the boiling water just to give myself enough room to add more water. But I'm not going to uh, stir it anymore. What I'm going to do is just cover it up and let it sit there and strain itself out. And so by the time I'm done, I should expect about oh, 17, 18 liters of wash that I can that I can ferment. So uh, you might wonder why would you put boiling water in there? It's not going to kill the enzyme. But at this point in time. That conversion has already taken place you're not going to get any more conversion from starch to sugar so uh, using hot water releases the the sugar from the grain bed it's kind of gooey in there and you can see as you add more water it lightens it up and uh, dilutes it a bit so it can strain a little faster so i'll check this later on tonight right now it's about mid-afternoon like i mentioned before if i was doing this in the evening i just wait until morning and then put the, the uh, yeast in, but uh, if it uh, drains before uh, bedtime, then I'll show you how I cool this down with a chiller, and then we can add the uh, yeast to it right away. Okay, there we go. Cover this thing up just to stop anything from falling in there that's not supposed to be in there, and I'll wait. So I've been letting this grain bed drain now for about three four hours i guess close to four hours and i see that uh it's pretty much 
it's all drained out. You see we're up to about 18, 19 liters of wash. So that's awesome. Wow. So what I'm going to do now is take the temperature of that, that um, my wash, and see where we're at, see if I have to chill that or not. I probably do. So I checked the temperature, it's right around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really perfect for for putting my yeast in. So I'm, I'm pretty happy that that temperature's dropped already. Now, if, it, if I did have to chill that down, I have this uh, chiller here. Let me see if I can show you kind of how that works. I'm not going to hook it up, obviously, because I don't need to, but uh, I have a copper coil. It has some fittings on it. Don't really need these fittings on here. I have the silicone tubing. And so uh, one end, I just shove it. I just shove the one end right up into this chopped up garden hose. Shove it up in there and it stays there. I immerse this into my wash. And then this part just sticks into the laundry tub. And uh, it only takes about 10 minutes. In five, 10 minutes, it'll drop the temperature right down. You can monitor exactly what the temperature's at and you can chill it real quick so you can get your yeast in there. Obviously, before I immerse that in there, I would clean it real good, put the uh, sterilizer on it. But uh, that's how my chiller works. Now, if you want to, I happen to get this, but if you want to make one, you just get some soft copper. You pinch the ends. If you don't have a bending tool, pinch the ends pinch the one end and then you fill it up with table salt and then you pinch the uh, open end and then you just wrap it around some cylindrical shape something that's uh, pretty sturdy mind you metal and then uh, when you got the a few coils going then you you just uh, cut the ends off you drain the salt out I use table salt because it's it pours real nice nice and fine it'll fill it up the idea behind that, putting table salt or something in there so that it doesn't collapse when you're bending it. Then, uh, and then it's easy to get rid of the table salt when you're done, it flushes out or just shake it out. It comes out real easy compared to say sand or something like that. So that's how you make a chiller if you want. It's real simple. A couple of flexible hoses, hook it into your tap and there you go. But I don't need it right now because uh, this is already at 80 degrees, which is perfect. So I'm just going to put this up on the bench and then we'll do that. I'll check the specific gravity too before I put the yeast in. So I'm going to check the specific gravity. I have my uh, sample tube here and my hydrometer to check the, uh, the potential for alcohol in this thing. So I'll use this turkey baster. Just pick that up at a hardware store. And put up enough, uh, and put enough of my wash into the sample tube. See what I get. Then I'll know what my potential is, and if this uh, mashing pro process has been successful. And yes, it looks pretty good. It looks like I have the same sort of uh, the same kind of potential as I would for beer. We're running around around. Uh, 6% alcohol potential. So that's good. So the temperature is good. The specific gravity is good. And so I'm going to put some yeast in here. So I'm going to put the yeast in now. So there's different ways of doing that. Uh, some some would prefer to activate the yeast, put it into a jar of warm water with a bit of sugar in it and let it start working. Um, I'm not going to do that. So I'm putting in a yeast that you typically use for wine. It's called EC1118. I've had good success with it. It's a low alcohol yeast. It's not for the high, higher alcohol thing because I'm only going to get five, six percent alcohol at this maximum. And I stir this around, wash, get it going, and then just gradually sprinkle it here, sprinkle it, <coughs> sprinkle it around the surface of the, my wash. And that's it. That's it. So now all I have to do is uh, 
it wait for 72 hours, let that ferment for 72 hours, then I can run it through the still. So that means your timing's got to be taken into consideration. If you can't run your still in three days from now, if you're busy, don't start it, okay? Because if, if it runs longer than 72, uh, I've had some really bad results and I did some research, found out that it caused a secondary fermentation after three days, brings in some some components of the grain that do not taste good and you can't get rid of them. And uh, so that's why I'm saying if you, you have to work with your schedule here, make sure that you're going to be able to run your still in 72 hours so that you don't get into that secondary fermentation type of situation where, where it's going to actually ruin the, uh, the end product. It won't taste good. So uh, I keep a log book. I write everything down that I do. I write down my ingredients. I write down the date. I write down how long I mashed it for, specific gravity, when I put the yeast in, so that I keep good track of it. So every batch I do, if something doesn't quite turn out the way I expected it to, then I make an adjustment. Then I can measure uh, if it made a difference or not and keep tweaking my recipe to improve it as I do each one. So, see you in three days. Just thought I'd give you a, a quick shot of what the grain bed looks like after the fluid has been drained out of it. So I just take this stuff and throw it in the backyard. Not in the backyard, I throw it in the garden, dig it in, it's a good compost. Apparently animals like to eat it, but I don't have any animals. So I'll just be putting that in the compost pile. So this is a batch of uh, trying to make a bourbon here, as we've discussed. Just open that up and just to show you what that should look like. This has been fermenting now for about two and a half days. See that nice foamy head on there? And uh, you can almost hear it bubbling a bit. So as I mentioned, this should, uh, should ferment for about, well, for not about, for no more than three days. So uh, this is like two and a half days, so tomorrow around noon hour, I'll be uh, running that through the still. You don't want it to ferment any longer than the two days. Or I should say the three days shouldn't ferment any longer than the three days because it'll bring some bad uh, flavors into your finished product. I'm just going to have a little quick sniff of this here. Wow, that smells good. You're going to love the smell of this stuff. So anyway, tomorrow, I'll be running that through the still, and we'll get back to you on that. This is day three. Since I've started fermenting the wash that I'm, uh, I'm making uh, my bourbon out of, I took a quick video yesterday on day two, and there was a heavy head of foam on the, <clears throat> on the top of the surface because of the... Um, that fermentation, that vigorous fermentation, but you see just a day later how that's pretty much dispersed. It's because the initial fermentation is complete. So uh, now we have to do the next step uh, to uh, distill it. So first of all, though, I'm going to take a specific gravity reading just to uh, determine what the potential alcohol is or what the actual alcohol is in my wash. So I'll just do that now. So what I have here is... Uh, my uh, my tube that I'll put my sample in and my just standard hygrometer to check the specific gravity of my wash. So I'm going to do that right now. So just use a whoops. There we go. Use a one of these oven basters. We call it and. Draw some of that wash out of there until I have enough in my tube to float that hydrometer. It's floating now. So we're looking at our hygrometer here. Let's get that in focus. And we see where it's floating. Right about uh, where it says, see where it says zero? That's zero percent. That's the potential. So it's about one percent potential but well, we started out at six percent potential do the math so that means we have about five percent alcohol and now we started out at six ended up at one 
potential of uh, five percent of five percent alcohol so we have about 18 liters of mash so 18 times 0 0.05 do a bit of math there you end up with 0.9 so that's a uh, 0.9 liter or 900 milliliters of pure alcohol in my mash so that's my that's what my uh, the maximum I'm going to get out of this is is a little less than one liter of pure alcohol but then I'll I'll give it a little less than that but well let's put this in the still now and uh, see what happens next I'm just going to grab the uh, my big container here and pour it into my my still the pot of the still sludge here at the end but the only risk with that is if you get a burn start burning the bottom of the pot but it'll be okay so there you go I'll clean this out later it's kind of gross looking right now so I'm going to take this up and put it on the fire here I'll just try to demonstrate how I where I get my cooling water from for the condenser and the still but this is my laundry room it's right below the kitchen so I just ran some uh, PEX piping up and uh, two, two, uh, two lengths of PEX pipe. One is for supply and one is exactly for uh, the drain. And I just hooked it right up, used some fittings, hook it right up to, my, to the tap on my laundry tub. Tighten that real good and then turn it on. And uh, so the water goes up goes in behind the stove where I have my uh, valve so I can control the, the flow of water and as you see I have it open and now the uh, it's going through my condenser and it's coming out through my drain line here I'll just uh, pick this up and give you a little better shot over there it is draining and these pipes these just go right up and uh, boom they go up into the kitchen and behind the stove. My wife lets me get away with stuff like that. Pretty good wife. And that's how I do my cooling. So something you can just fab up. Because uh, if your stove happens to be right near your kitchen sink, you can just hook it in your kitchen sink. But that wasn't my case. So, so that's how I sort of get my cooling water for the condenser. So I got the my still on the stove. It's on the flame. And just waiting for it to reach temperature, and it'll start bringing the uh, distillate out and into my jar, which I have propped up on a upside down pot here. I'll just explain a few things about this still. So that's my 20 liter still. Uh, the lid sits on there. I actually fabricated this up. It used to be a flat top, but I wanted to have a dome to have a bit of a pot style still. Um, got a silicone gasket here and it's crucial that when if you decide to make it still it has to be absolutely tight any vapors escaping you're just losing alcohol so uh, I got a two inch copper column it's about two feet long goes into a reducer to one inch then I have my uh, temperature gauge right near the top and then my lime arm goes down and right about here reduces from one inch down to half and then inside here it reduces again inside here to a quarter inch soft copper and that quarter inch copper runs down inside this three quarter inch hard copper so that's my condenser so it runs through you can see how now it uh, got a series of adapters so that it runs out of here a quarter inch and then the uh, distillate runs right into this into the jar and uh, so my condenser, I explained to you earlier how I was getting the, the um, cooling water from down underneath this kitchen is the laundry. I have these two PEX lines that I, that I brought up and uh, just a standard shut off valve you find underneath the lavatory or behind your toilet. Runs up and uh, supplies cold water to the, to the uh, condenser, fills up, or I should say the cooling. Well, it's a condenser 
and it just runs up and comes out here and then back out through my drain back down to the laundry tub in the basement so that's how that works this is what we call a stripping run I'm just stripping all the alcohol out of it I'm not concerned about cuts or getting a too particular about separating the good from the bad and the ugly and so on. I'll do that later on when I do a spirit run once I've done all my batches, four or five batches, use up all the grain that I bought and then uh, then we'll do a spirit run. So I'll take another video in a minute which uh, we'll see how this looks when the distillate starts coming out. So now we see the uh, product here, my distillate coming out of the my uh, still out of the condenser pretty good rate I'll just uh, if you look at that hose you can see it's not a whole lot of water going through there and then up here at the temperature gauge can't see if we can get a good shot of that well, I guess that's about as close you're gonna get running at about 80 so I'm gonna run this right up to about 90 it eventually will run it right up to about 95 degrees. You don't want to do that on a spirit run, but on a stripping run, you just want to get all the alcohol out of it. So that's about it. I'll just keep running this. Incidentally, this took about two hours to get up to temperature until finally the distillate started coming out. It takes about two hours, and then it's going to run for about another two hours maybe. So make sure you've got something to do around the kitchen. Otherwise, you're going to get bored. So now I've been running this still for a while, doing my stripping run, and I have a, about a half of a jar of distillate here. I'm going to check to see how much alcohol my distillate has in my stripping run. So what I have here is a, my sample tube and, and what they call an alcometer. This is different than the device that measures a specific gravity. This measures the actual alcohol by volume. In the liquid so that's the ABV alcohol by volume so that in here we use a funnel so that we don't spill any because we certainly wouldn't want to miss a drop or lose a drop of this stuff precious in the morning so that we can float that alcometer and let's give it a bit of a spin get the air off it tap it a bit not crucial but could have it. So I'm looking at this and uh, right around 40%. I'll see if I can bring this up a little closer to you. I don't have a cameraman so I've got to do this on my own. I'll zoom it and then uh, yeah, it's good right there. Spin it a bit. See, you can see the water level is right, or the water level, the distillate is right around 40%. Okay, so back to the bench here then. I'll focus that in a bit. So in the stripping run, that's about what you're going to get. You get 40 at the beginning, and eventually it'll drop, drop, drop down like 15 20 percent we're just trying to strip all the alcohol out of our mash and uh, probably end up with about uh, two liters of of, uh, of distillate later when we do the spirit run we'll get much higher alcoholic content we'll get in the high 80s low 90s initially and a uh, big difference this stuff you could you could taste it if you want. It doesn't taste very good. There's a lot of junk in it, and um, yeah. So I'll just every once in a while I'll test some of the distillate just to verify where we're at. And as the temperature of the still rises, the percentage of alcohol in the distillate will lower. You'll see that as it goes along. So you can almost tell by the temperature on the head of this uh, of my still, more or less how much alcohol, the percentage of alcohol is in the distillate. Okay. So I finished my stripping run from that 18 liter batch 
a wash that I had and uh, you can see I have four full jars 500 milliliters each so that's two liters and then this here final one it's about 200 milliliters in there now the uh, first jar came out at 40 percent gradually reduced uh, the alcoholic uh, alcohol by volume as the uh, stripping run progressed and finally at the very end that last 200 milliliters is running about 12 percent so what i do next is i just throw everything in a jug let it mix up a bit and then i test to see what my average is so that's what i'll do now so i poured that 2.2 liters of of a distillate from my stripping run into this three liter jug stirred it up a little bit now i'm going to see what my average alcohol was for this stripping run so i have my alcometer here gotta be careful this is pretty heavy don't want to spill anything and put that in my sample tube Loading, so there you go. What do we got? I, I expect around 25-30%. Let's see what we get. There you go. Right around 25%. So we have two and a half or 2.2 liters at uh, 25%. So that's what we get out of an 18 liter. 18 liter uh, wash and uh, so I'm going to just uh, put this in with the rest of my stripping runs I have a number of them now probably take about five or six stripping runs to use up the sack of grain and then we'll be able to do a spirit run which is a little different I have to modify my still a few changes to it to uh, make it do a better more pure end product that tastes better yeah so that's the uh, stripping run.